Welcome everyone back to the Youth 2.0 Virtual Summit. It seems like some of us are still trickling back from our breakout session. And for those of us just joining us right now, um, live on Facebook or on YouTube, we are so incredibly grateful to have you here. This summit is an opportunity designed by young people for young people to connect, introspect, and express with hundreds of others today for a self-transformative weekend full of amazing keynote speakers, invigorating discussions, and memorable activities. We've had stimulating speakers so far, we've had very deep discussions in our breakout rooms, and we've made so many new friends. First, we would like to thank our partners for the summit who are on screen today. Their support and help has allowed our event to reach the heights that it actually has. For our live participants through Zoom, make sure you use the Q&A feature to ask our speaker any questions throughout today's presentation. Our speaker for today will be Sharath Jeevan, founder and CEO of Intrinsic Labs. I'll let our interviewer introduce him a little bit more, but let's see who will be conducting the interview today. Dr. Swathi Kannan is a surgical, general, and cosmetic dermatologist currently practicing in California. Dr. Kannan incorporates relaxation, meditation, breathing, and positive affirmations as part of patient care to reduce patient stress and anxiety prior to, during, and after surgeries. She is also passionate about mentoring trainees and ensuring that they achieve inner stability, clarity, and focus while ensuring that they still chase their career goals. I am pleased to welcome Swati Kannan. I guess I was muted, okay. <laughs> Thanks uh, so much for having me today. I'm really excited to join uh, this Youth 2.0 seminar. Um, I. I think uh, today is really going to be an exciting uh, seminar because of, we're going to be chatting with Sharth Jeevan, who is an expert on intrinsic motivation. He resides in London and he is the CEO of two big companies. The first one is called Stir Education, and this is a company that focuses on empowering teachers in India, Uganda, and other countries globally. And more recently, he actually founded a social lab or organization called Intrinsic Labs. And this particular organization applies motivational principles to solve our biggest motivational challenges and to reignite our inner drive. In 2019, he was recognized as UK's uh, top 10 leading social entrepreneurs. And he's also currently writing a book that applies these principles, which will be out in 2021. So he's very successful, very driven. I'm really excited to talk to him today. Um, and without further delay, Sharath, the stage is yours. Thanks, Swati. Uh, and great to, great to connect. Uh, you can hear me okay? Just a quick check. I can hear you. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. And really, really uh, good, good, um, good afternoon, good evening here uh, in London. The, uh, that Shakespeare modern boxing, Mike Tyson once said, Fight plan is great. Do you get punched in the face? And that's probably how, like, I guess a number of us are, uh, are feeling. Uh, we're probably, you know, felt we were in the ring, we were fighting the good fight. We had that doctoral dissertation on, we were studying to be a doctor, we were uh, on um, applying to graduate school, doing really well in a job, having a very deep relationship. Uh, with someone important to us, perhaps somewhere else across the country or the world. And I guess COVID-19 came, came in the way and sort of knocked us, well, knocked us out, maybe gave us that, that fatal punch. I guess what I want to use today um, is to maybe suggest that that, that punch in, in, in that ring may, may actually have a, an element of a silver lining. Because I want us to question whether we were fighting the right fight in the first place. And here I, I really want to unapologetically and unreservedly apologize for what my, my generation has done to uh, this, to, to all of you, to, to your generation of youth. And um, what they asked me to, you know, what the proof of the pudding is, you know, in terms of my age, let me just show you very quickly, you can probably see them, some, some white hairs, if can come across on a Zoom screen or not, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm turning 44 this year. And um, 
I think my generation, I think the responsibility for this has really honestly screwed things up as, as leaders, as, as parents and role models. And I think we've made three really fundamental mistakes. I think we've really deeply misunderstood the, the idea of purpose in our lives. It was really moving hearing our old speaker in the, in the break just now about his story and the idea of purpose. But I think we've, we haven't fully understood that um, uh, at all. And it's certainly not communicated very well to the, uh, to the next generation coming in. I think we've undermined and eroded the, the sense of autonomy and what we do as well as a second problem. The third thing is we've encouraged um, all the wrong things, I think, in terms of the mastery, uh, particularly, for example, as parents. And I think we've fundamentally confused the idea of mastery with the idea of competition. So purpose, autonomy, mastery, PAM, PAM, if anyone's got an, an auntie PAM, that's an easy way to remember those three ideas. I'd like to talk about them a bit today. Um, but those, you know, those elements, purpose, autonomy, mastery, are what 30, 35 years of psychology research and behavioral research really shows motivates us uh, very deeply beyond things like money and status and, and so on. And I think the, the fact that we haven't been able to um, have those in the right way has led to a really profound motivation crisis for many of us. Uh, and especially those of us who are uh, perhaps on the younger end of the spectrum as well. So let me just start with the idea of purpose. And um, yeah, I was just remarking, or just, um, remarking to myself this week how it's strange how we were celebrating billionaires who are putting private uh, explorations out of space this week while our earthly cities burn. And you know, we try yoga, we try mindfulness, we might try Instagram likes and trying to find that perfect picture to impress everyone else. But I think there's something we've deeply forgotten in that, in that discussion. And, and that's that really purpose is about, that's very core about serving others and helping others. Exactly the opposite of what economics has taught us about incentives and self-interest and Adam Smith's you know, famous, uh, uh, you know, famous hand. And for me, it's been a really interesting journey. About eight years ago, I started STIR. And the irony of this was that um, I started STIR Education, and that's what he said, with the idea of how could we try and find cool ideas from teachers all across the developing world that we could spread and share. And I knew that motivation of teachers was a, was a problem. I'd heard about this. I'd heard, for example, in India, where we work, we work in about 35,000 schools this year, that you know, one in four teachers in India was absent. I'd read a poll in Uganda that said that 80% uh, of teachers in Uganda would quit the job tomorrow if they had the chance. And so I thought motivation is not something we can, we can worry about. We've got to think about something else because this is too hard. And there's an irony there because I, um, I myself am the product of a great teacher. Uh, I was lucky to do my undergraduate um, education at, at Cambridge University in the UK. And that was really purely because of a very, very stubborn teacher I had who saw something in me that perhaps no one else saw. And, um, you know, at one point, I didn't think Cambridge was, was right for me. I didn't think it was good enough, but he just wouldn't, would not take uh, no for an answer. And at one point, he literally forced me into the back of his car. I think um, safeguarding standards were a bit more relaxed uh, those days. Um, and took me down the, the highway to, to Cambridge and literally you know, stood outside various admission tutors' offices while I spoke to them and got the information I needed to make an application. And that simple act of stubbornness sort of basically changed my, my life. But somehow I thought that's, you know, that's for me, that was my life, but that's not true of, of, of other teachers in, in India or Africa, for example. And so when I started STIR, um, it was a crazy summer. We started in the summer of 2012, and we were combing the streets, the slums, the gullies of Delhi. Um, it was um, 42 degrees centigrade heat. I'm not sure exactly what that is in Fahrenheit, but uh, uh, I guess it's 110, 120, I'm a quick uh, count there, uh, but it, incredibly hot. And um, I remember falling into potholes. I remember asking ear, earwax remover wallas and, and um, psycho rickshaw wallas to the ways through gullies and my phone, Google Maps, was just not a reliable friend. The mosquitoes were, were far more reliable. But at the end of this, we collected a set of ideas of teaching practices, really cool. We published a, a nice book that looked very glossy and we felt very, very proud of ourselves. And then everything went wrong. So our office in Delhi, there were just three of us at that point, just did not stop ringing for days. 
And the calls are from teachers saying, look, I, I know my idea wasn't selected. I'm not arguing about the process. I know it is a fair process, but you've awoken in me. You've ignited in me something I haven't felt for a long time. And, uh, you know, a few of these, we kind of ignored them, but it just got to such a ridiculous level. We thought we have to do something here. So we tried a little experiment and we um, booked the largest place we could, we could find a rickety old wedding hall on the outskirts of Delhi. It's probably become a shopping mall now, given, given Delhi's growth. But, and we called the 400 teachers we were dealing with and asked them to come uh, on a Sunday morning um, to the, the beginnings of what we call a teacher network meeting. And I remember it was, a, you know, I think it's 45 degrees centigrade at that time. Um, it was the last day of a, of a final day, cricket match, test match between India and England, nail biting climax. And we were taking bets that morning of how many teachers of 400 would show up. And I remember personally betting about 80 would, would be there. And in fact, about 340 showed up that, uh, that day. And some, many, of them, uh, um, many of them were Muslim women. They brought young kids with them. So we had to set up a small crash on the side, uh, impromptu. Uh, but I remember really that, that sense of laughter, that joy of, of teachers sharing ideas, connecting. What is it really can be a very, very lonely job. And I think at that moment, that, that, that sort of whole day just gave me my purpose. And I realized what we have to do is think about how can we reignite the intrinsic motivation, the purpose, the autonomy, the mastery in the teachers we were seeing as well. Uh, and it made me really question my own, um, uh, my own life a lot along the way. And I guess a year ago, and again, about a strange thing happened where we, we, we were at this point now working with about 200,000 teachers from the, the initial uh, small number in Delhi uh, in, in about 35,000 schools. And we were really grappling with quite deep questions of how do you practically reignite motivation in teachers that might, might have felt very cynical before. And I met a, a literary agent right by accident, and she was just really interested in the work and said, there's a book in this. And some of the things you're grappling with um, uh, with teachers are, are really applicable to all of us, not just in work, but also as parents, as citizens, as, uh, as spouses, um, as uh, how we think of our, uh, uh, our politics today. The book has been a really, a, it, it sort of um, came from by accident, but I've discovered a new purpose and hence the, the work around um, creating intrinsic lab to apply some of this thinking on motivation to many aspects of our lives as well. So kind of the idea really being a purpose being, uh, you know, evolving over time is really important. And I think it's not just a, a personal sense of purpose, but also one at a country and, and, and global level as well. I think um, for the book, I talked to many, many good politicians out there uh, all over the world. I remember talking to a lady called Melissa Schusterman, who is a, a newly appointed uh, um, representative in the state of Pennsylvania. And she had no political background whatsoever. But she had got so disillusioned by the cynicism, the way that many political candidates uh, and representatives in, in Pennsylvania were effectively controlled by, um, by lobbies and by you know, special interests. And she felt this just wasn't for her. No one was looking out for her, especially as a woman. And so she had a lot of mentoring, a number of grassroots groups um, helped cultivate her campaign. And she's now become the deputy chief whip of Pennsylvania there. So I think a lot of good people in, in public office, and I think it's up to us to think about how we can try to um, reignite that, that purpose in, 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 our, you know, in our politics as well. So we can be um, more successful in solving some of our biggest problems. Amazing how, how small things can make a big difference. I was driving, I was in the US in February just before COVID uh, um, erupted. And driving in La Jolla, I don't know if you guys know La Jolla, it's a very up, up, upscale um, part of San Diego. And I, I, I drive in England, so I drive on the wrong side of the road. I just parked my car the wrong way, the wrong direction. Right? And uh, that's all I did. It was parked at a normal place and went to get a taco. Because, uh, tacos are pretty good there. I just came back uh, about an hour later and I could see a police officer outside the car. I said, what, what's going on? And uh, it said your, your car's you know, parked the wrong, you know, the, the wrong, you should be facing the, the side of the traffic. And some, someone in that very upscale neighborhood had called the police. And I was about to get a ticket, but um, the, the kind of irony was the, the, the guy's ticket machine wasn't working. And I thought just in one, you know, one an hour, I'd just seen a, a microcosm of what's happening in America now where you know, we have you know, these, these increasingly these elements of affluence, but also these sort of daily acts of small, of almost cruelty. And, 
the fact that our some of our key public services are not always you know funded in the way they, they should be. And I think as a generation, we've thrown a number of problems on you guys and thrown climate change, inequality, uh, identity uh, rates, of course, we've seen over the last week how that's exploded. And yeah, I just really encourage all of you to find that purpose and, and try and step in the ring yourselves. So I talked a bit about purpose. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit, second theme around autonomy. And I think we've managed to systematically dismantle it in almost every aspect of what we do. I was talking to a teacher in England who um, was being told by her principal, not just how to teach each lesson, but even the, the sort of classwork she displayed on the wall of her, of her, of her classroom, height it should be displayed at. And she told me the, the principal, we have a, a body called Ofsted who are like our school regulator that give rating to every school. She told me that the principal no longer thinks of what's right or wrong, all they think of is what would Ofsted think? And in the UK now, 40% of our teachers who come in at huge expense to all of us, right, the public purse, they leave the profession within two years. In the US, I was just seeing some data, I think November last year, 30,000 teachers across the country quit in one month. It was a record number of, of resignations. And I think a lot of this is symptomatic of how we're trying to reduce teaching into a kind of a a paint by numbers, a kind of a game of logistics, when actually it's a very complex, you know, highly, highly skilled profession. And I think the numbers, the bureaucracy, the teaching the test has really destroyed motivation uh, in the teaching profession, which is what I'm very comfortable, I'm very familiar with. But I think it's also leading to a growing alienation in the work, world of work more generally. And I think so many people, especially young people I talk to, I think many of us now feel we have to wear a mask at at work, right? Not the COVID mask that we're now having to work because of social distancing and so on, but a sort of a, a metaphorical mask, right? And almost um, unable to express our authentic self. And I think one of the things that's been so interesting over these last few weeks of doing, you know, I've been on God knows how many hours of Zoom each day, just being able to peer into people's houses and see their real self themselves, see a child come in, you might see my six year old jump in at some point here um, uh, and, and disturb them. It's a much more human element than some of the, the games we play at work, the kind of grandstanding, they seem to have been you know, uh, diminished. And I hope that one of the silver linings of this is that we can perhaps find a more authentic um, sense of, uh, of that. And I think you know, if you look at places like Silicon Valley, um, and if you watch the HBO program, there's a, a nice scene where the two startups are meant to merge, both of them are fueled by a lot of Silicon Valley uh, uh, venture capital money, and they refuse the merger because they can't agree on the, the quality of the free coffee that's being provided. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, as many of the tech firms and others have competed on crazy perks, free lunches, all this kind of stuff, I pay, which of course I'm not saying is not important, but I think we have, we've kind of neglected that element of autonomy. How do we help create a working life where we feel we're in control of what we do and we feel we can express our, our authentic self at work as well? So I've talked here about, about purpose and autonomy, the P and the A. The last bit on the mastery side is, um, I think how we've all screwed you guys up as parents, I think, frankly, and I'm, I'm very aware of this being a parent of young kids myself. Um, you know, in Palo Alto, um, when I was researching the book, one of the things I, I learned with my horror was that the, the, the platform of many Caltrain stations now has to be manned by armed guards because there have been such a spate of teenage suicide and teenage anxiety, you know, self-harm, they're as common on the Silicon Valley circuit now as valuations and, uh, uh, and, and big data, for example. And obviously the people guarding these, uh, these rails are often um, African-American, they're Hispanic, they're often on, on minimum or low wage, and they're, they're guarding the, the children of the, of the very elite. And it's this crazy irony of where we've got to that even for, you know, but where we have you know, many of us who've been very you know, financially successful, that's not been able to create happy childhoods. And I think we're, we're doing a, a really injustice in school and not creating the ability for, for young people to graduate from school in particular and from college, be able to face that world of unknown unknowns. And you know, if we don't believe that after these last few weeks, I think uh, you know, this realization anything can, can happen. And so some of the things I've been working on in the world of education have been around, you know, how do we create a sense of safety 
among children and young people, their emotional safety, be themselves and to be open to learning. That deep sense of engagement, that sense of curiosity, and that self and sense of self-esteem that will help them propel through their um, through their lives. My own kid, one is nine and one is six, they say they prefer lockdown because there's much less shouting going around. They're shouting by their teachers, and they're shouting by me probably, who kind of spends my time, my wife, spending her time shuttling them between the tennis activity or the whatever, you know, myriad extracurricular activities they, they normally do. Instead, we just have more time with them ourselves. And I think a lot of what um, mastery is about is about how we can try to keep reinventing ourselves, be lifelong learners, and succeed in this world of unknown unknowns. Um, I'm a huge tennis fan, and Roger Federer signed a $300 million contract with Uniqlo, the Japanese clothes manufacturer, when 37 years old. So probably had a couple more years left in the tank to play tennis, but he was being chosen not because, just because of his tennis, but because he had become a real ambassador for the sport. He'd reinvented himself over his time from being a great sportsman to being a great statesman. And that's kind of what we, we all need to do, I think, as well. Um, you know, often I think we talk about survival of the fittest and Darwin and so on. But if you actually read Darwin carefully, a lot of his ideas are how you create a diversity of talent, not just you know, doing the same thing and being slightly better, but creating, you know, playing to our strengths and being able to have a number of different talents coexist. I think that's a really important piece for, uh, for mastery as well. So yeah, I've talked about uh, purpose, I've talked about autonomy about mastery, the, the PAM in those uh, few things. And just wanted to pro apologize profoundly again for my, what my generation has done. Um, but I think there is that silver lining. That's where I think this, these unusual few weeks in our lives can really help us. If I go back to that, that, that uh, quote from Mike Tyson, Tyson was legendary in the world of boxing for knocking opponents out, often in one or two ra rounds. And got to such a point that many U.S. Um, uh, audiences didn't want to see him match anymore because the, the fights were too short, frankly, to make it a good value, you know, good value for money. So he played a really famous, uh, he fought a really famous fight in Tokyo with another boxer called Buster Douglas. And Douglas managed to beat Tyson in one of the biggest um, upsets ever in sport. And it happened after a 10 second knockout. So Douglas was knocked out, managed to take the max amount of time, rebound and finally beat Tyson that way around as well. So for us, it might not have been 10 seconds. It's knocked out, it might have been you know, two, three months. But I think it's really important that um, we, we use this time really you know, purposefully. And I think a fight plan is great, as, as Tyson would say, but I think it's only great if we're in the right fight, uh, in the right ring, and that's much more important. And I think it's, um, as we emerge from lockdown, what I'd encourage us all to do is to think about how we can unlock our minds and unleash some of the things we really want to do, things that really drive our own motivation quite deeply. It's really our ring to fight in, and I think uh, there's everything to play for right now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sharad. You made some really great points. And one of the things that I want to touch on is the political and racial unrest that's really characterizing America and probably, you know, all a lot of other countries globally. But before we do that, I wanted to uh, get an explanation. I mean, you're an ex expert on intrinsic motivation on, you know, getting out the purpose and drive. So can you explain the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? And also, you know, for example, uh, teachers, you know, in schools, we have grades, awards, uh, you know, first prize ribbons. How do those things affect intrinsic motivation? And then how the effect of getting likes on social media and Instagram, how that can affect intrinsic motivation? So I'm going to start there first. Uh, great question. Uh, in, um, and yeah, so I think the, the really simple definition of intrinsic motivation is it's about inner drive, and, and it's about doing something because it's inherently fulfilling and worthwhile, not because of external pressures. So there are different types of external pressures. Um, an Instagram like is a kind of soft one, but still external. A, um, 
a uh, you know a financial incentive. I'll give you this much um, money if you hit this you know sales target. It's very extrinsic or external. But what we're learning, I think, about motivation is the much the most sustainable way to really motivate people is to appeal to to intrinsic factors. And one of the challenges with some of the external focus is it's quite easy to gain, right? We, we try and we focus all about hitting that sales target, but we ignore whether we, we provided you know, a fair service to the person we sold to, for example. And it creates all kinds of perverse incentives. I'd argue that the 2008 financial crisis was a direct, uh, uh, direct manifestation of that as well. So yeah, wherever possible, I think the research is pretty clear that Things that appeal to our inner driver and intrinsic motivation are much more powerful, and much more sustainable. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, I mean, so what are the tools that you use then to ignite, you know, somebody's inner drive? Because I may not even be aware of the reasons why I want to pursue certain things. So, what tools do you use to ignite that drive and to bring out the purpose that you spoke about? One of the really interesting things about it, I think we haven't had that answer till quite recently. And I think the work in the book I've been trying to work on has been trying to bring that to bear. So there's been a lot of psychological theory about these ideas of autonomy, of a purpose, uh, autonomy of mastery, but we're only just learning how to actually apply them in real life. And what I find talking to um, in applying these situations, um, everything from marriage to the world of work, a lot of it is about deep listening understanding the problem, understanding what the person or the organization or the, the society is trying to achieve and trying to help them interpret purpose, autonomy and mastery, that PAM uh, acronym for themselves in that context. How does it link to the goals they're ultimately trying to achieve there? So a lot of it's deep listening, helping them craft a strategy to, um, to, to drive that and coaching them along the way there. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all because it so depends, obviously, on the context and what people want to try and use this for. Yeah, I think deep listening is one of the uh, qualities that a lot of educational communities are trying to focus on. And the people listening, like, what are the principles of motivation and purpose and autonomy? What principles can be applied for the betterment of communities in general so that we are more constructive and less destructive? I think there's a two great examples in the same week as well, instead of what a contrast, right? But you know, I think back to the Kennedy, I wasn't born, I wasn't not, not, not that, quite that old, but uh, I think about when, you know, when, when Kennedy put a man on the moon, right? And uh, if anyone's watched The Crown, for example, the Netflix show, watching Prince Philip and how he was mesmerized in front of his TV, watching the first Neil Armstrong and all of those elements, um, it's so different from, and not that, you know, I'm a fan of Elon Musk, but the, uh, um, the way this was done was such a different piece. I think what Kennedy was doing was trying to use the space mission as a symbol of, of exploration. And I saw um, uh, I will show a very nice quote about you know that, that that determination of America to put its mind to what it needs to do. That what the space mission was a real metaphor of a symbol of. And it became a really strong sense, a metaphor of uh, oh, sorry, an image of, of national purpose for everyone. And I think what's, it's so different from the spirit in which now billionaires can now privatize space, right? It's a, it's a private offering, people have the money can do it. There is no sense of common purpose behind this, I would argue, in the same way. And I think that is the fundamental problem of politics in, in the US, UK, and many countries now, where we have, you know, both haves and have nots. It's incredibly hard to create a, a um, the have nots can be economic, it can be racial, as we've seen. Uh, that divide is across many dimensions, but we're not able to create a political narrative and a story of progress of purpose uh, at the national level that transcends that, that brings everyone in the same story. And instead we have this kind of very factional, increasingly tribal politics there. And I've been working in Ethiopia for last year, and it's been really interesting seeing how uh, the, the, the prime minister there, it's a, Ethiopia is a country of many tribes. He's done a, you know, a, a remarkable job of trying to bring those tribes together and create a new sense of national identity that we're all Ethiopian now. And I think we can all, you know, we think of the famine in Ethiopia, but actually I think we can all learn from what Ethiopia is doing in many Western countries today. Can you explain a little bit more? I, I'm, I'm not really too aware of what Ethiopia is doing and I don't know if our audience is either and how that would relate to like our communities in the US and on the West Coast. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so most Ethiopians consider themselves to be uh, a traditional one, one of about um, six major tribes. And the country really has been a sort of um, a collection of different tribal identities. There has really been a sense of a national identity there. But he's tried to create a narrative that tries to bring Ethiopia together and a sense we're all Ethiopian now. So um, Rwanda did this after genocide. Uh, Ethiopia is now trying to apply some of these ideas. And so it's been tricky. I'm mean, not by any means it's been an easy, an easy journey. But I think that it's almost ironic that I think as Ethiopia tries to become less tribal, quite literally, countries like America or the UK are becoming more tribal in politics in a, in a somewhat different way. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think the, the divide between the have and have not is becoming, maybe if not more prominent, but it's becoming more on, it's coming more on TV. So I think the racism, social unrest, all of that has always been there. But as Will Smith said, it's just being filmed more. So it's coming more to light now. Um, I think, as you said, the, the generation, your like older generations have made these, uh, made lives very challenging. So I think how, what uh, can the upcoming generations do to avoid the mistakes of that have been made in the older generations? Like what can we do to redo the narrative for the Western civilization, which, you know, like you said, we're moving away from, moving away from unification. Yeah, so I think if you look at sort of the, the genius of America, going back to our old school, I think it's been about trying to create that public um, belief and credibility in the American dream and, and, and you know, the story of immigration, all of these things. But if you look at the data now, America, the chances of someone actually getting into the next um, socioeconomic class are close. They're not zero, but they're extremely low now. Social mobility is, is abysmally low in the US, lower than almost any every other country in the world now. And I think we've got to think about how we try and create um, a sense of purpose that is genuinely common across the, the country we're talking about America. And I think that that has been lost. I think what's happened now is the sense of um, almost a winner takes all world, right? Where a few great minds and who are smart and also often frankly lucky, uh, the, the must of this world, um, can have can be visionaries and they're celebrated and lauded. And that's what we've started to prize in society rather than the sense of a collective progress, right? all of us moving in the same way. And I think because the way the world economy has worked, because of this winner takes all dynamic, you see this um, inequality rising much, much more sharply. And that's not you know inevitable. We can change that through policy and how we set up our, our governments. And I just think there's so many, there are so many of us who are good people in politics already in the US that I've talked to who just need that encouragement and that ability to surface above some of the tribal uh, crap for one of a better word that's there now. But also I'd really encourage those of us in this room who are thinking about living a political life or taking part in government in some way or leadership there. One of the most important things we, we do, we just don't celebrate it very much. And it's much more likely to be on the cover of a fortune than Forbes rather than you know, in, a, in a government role, but actually where really we can make real change is working in government or with government very closely as well. And how do you, uh, I mean, working in government, especially let's say for uh, people of Indian and Asian descent, it's not really something that's pushed, right? We are pushed to become lawyers, doctors, engineers. You were in economics and then you switched gears. So how do, what are the, what is the narrative that you use to motivate people to go into these positions of leadership to make an impact? So I think it's tough. I think definitely there's a lot of things, a lot of baggage that has to be discarded. And I remember, you know, I grew up in India for quite a bit of my life. And uh, I remember, um, you know, spending summers in Chennai, where I'm originally from. And, you know, aunts and uncles would come from the staircases in their houses and they'd declare, you know, my son Rajesh is, is destined to be a doctor. You know, my daughter Vidya is going to be an accountant, uh, those kinds of things. And I think, but I think the world has moved on. And actually, you know, I work a lot in India now and uh, we've got a, a, a large team there. That India has changed a lot, actually, that, you know, um, that the amount of professions you can do now in India is mind boggling. And people who are most successful, if you're a plumber and actually can have some good levels of customer service, you're in massive demand. You can be a, a radio journalist, you can be a blogger. Uh, you know, a, um, a close friend of mine was a top, a top engineering student has become a wedding planner. For example, this stuff would have been unthinkable like 15 years ago. So I just think, you know, India has moved on. I think we all need to move on too. 
Yeah, I, I think though that winner takes all mentality is still very much prevalent, not only within the Indian and Asian communities, but also within the other households, you know, that want to move up within their social rank, they have that competitive winner takes all mentality, which then causes a lot of anxiety and stress for individuals who cannot meet those expectations. So in, in those kinds of scenarios, how, I mean, what do you do, what do you do to, to get out of that? Because that's all extrinsic motivation. So what do you do to then get out of that kind of rut that's imposed awesome. by society? And so one of the things that, you know, I studied uh, Roger Federer, being the tennis fan that I am, for example, he's, a, he's won the largest number of Grand Slam titles, 20 titles in his, his career. But if you read about what he says about what motivates him, it's not actually beating someone um, else. You ask him, to, he talks about, you know, playing the perfect set in his mind. And that perfect set is, is, is played against himself. And he's never played the perfect set yet, right? So mastery is a bit like a sort of slope where you're constantly going up, but you never quite reach. I think the people who really are successful in life are ones who, who find a problem they're deeply immersed in and just they're obsessed by getting better and better and mastering that uh, as much as they can with the humility they'll never get to the to nirvana to perfection, right? And I think that drives them much more than, than competition. And competition has had some good things, but on the whole, it's incredibly wasteful. Because what it's doing is immediately you cannot be happy no matter how good you're progressing unless you're better than someone else. And you immediately put the your self worth, your self identity. It's not something you can no longer can control, right? Because it's a comparison now. So I think mastery is much better than competition in a way of thinking about progress and, and that driving us and making us uh, more motivated, rather than trying um, rather than use competition itself. Yeah, I like that. So kind of becoming a master of what you want to do and and getting your passion out. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of times we're driven to do certain things, but then we lose that motivation. So how do you tap and continuously nurture that intrinsic motivation, even when external factors are overwhelming and distracting? Yeah, so, so I guess being Indians, I guess that I, I fundamentally believe you can, you can fall off after getting, getting married. And, uh, you know, that we've learned that with 200,000 teachers at Stern now, right? That they, uh, you know, they, they probably came in with some level of motivation for what they were doing. But it got beaten out of them because the system, not, not because they're bad people. No one wakes up, you know, in the morning saying, you know, my, my mission in life is to do harm to children I'm teaching. But the system is so um, so cancerous, right? The culture is so negative. So if a teacher shows up uh, and another teacher will say, you know, why are you showing up? You're going to get paid anyway. You're making us look bad, right? Or if you call up a parent or if you do extra homework or so extra assignments, so how do you change that, I think, is the big question. And, and part of it is around how we can um, really bring back these elements of, of autonomy, mastery, purpose. But what's important is it's not just for uh, the teachers themselves. It's also for the people in, in this situation, for those around them. So what do their managers think and the leaders think? What do the children think around them? So we've got to kind of look at how we ignite, reignite in a drive in in many elements in a system, make that change really sustainable. So if you're an athlete, it's also about how you, you know, how do, what does your sports scholarship allow you to do? Who are the people that have power in that system? We've got to apply motivation ideas to think more systemically about problems in a way. So then, yeah, so to the teacher that has that is losing motivation to do, to teach. And to somebody like me, I'm, a, I'm in healthcare and, you know, we have a term called burnout, physician yeah. burnout, which is yeah. very, you know, heavily talked about. What do you, what do you tell them so that they can reignite their drive to continue teaching, to continue practicing medicine or any, you know, to continue being an athlete? Yeah, so, so for a teacher, I think fundamentally motivation is about seeing a child learn. For, for a physician, it's about seeing their patient Thrive really through that work, and I think what we've done uh, remarkably well. I think in the in the UK, the NHS has been masterful at this. The I think the US uh, health uh, uh, Byzantine system has been even better. But we've completely disintermediated the link between the patient and, and 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 the physician, and instead made the physician feel like they're they're really serving a bureaucracy, whether it's a corporate bureaucracy or a non-profit one. One of the big healthcare groups, it's still the same dynamic. And I think a lot of things we're seeing and some, some, some ideas in the Netherlands coming out 
is how we can bring physicians' motivation back by giving them better feedback loops, not forcing targets on, you know, we can only spend 10 minutes per, per case with a doctor. I was seeing my local doctor recently, and I had two, two problems uh, to talk to her about, but uh, uh, I could only do one because I'd hit the time limit or whatever as well. So how do we help, you know, that real sense of relationship between a teacher, you know, a physician and the, and the patient there? Okay. Um, you talked about feedback loops. So are these feedback loops, what, can you tell me a little bit more about that? How can that be applied to other, you know, other uh, uh, services and, and jobs and, and lifestyle, et cetera? So a lot of it actually, I mean, for example, on marriage, you know, the, um, divorce rates have been um, skyrocketing around the world, for example. What some of the research is suggesting is these reasons nowadays, thankfully, are not usually to do with, you know, domestic violence in, in most cases, mm -hmm. um, thankfully, or bigger issues. But often what are sometimes called, um, there's a, um, a psychologist called uh, uh, John Gottman, who's invented this idea of sliding door theory, right? That a lot of relationships are about how you navigate these small challenges. And can a couple have a relationship and a discussion that is open to feedback on both sides? If they're not feeling happy, fulfilled, can they have an honest conversation when it's low stakes? Can they work together to improve that? That's a highly, highly um, predictive element of whether a marriage will succeed, much more than any big other idea there as well. So feedback and getting that in any system is really important for motivation. Yeah, and I think that's one of your core principles, right, of intrinsic labs is, is creating these intrinsic relationships. Um, and yeah, whether it's couples, parents, siblings, friends, um, you know, I, I feel like in this social media age, um, a lot of people are struggling to develop these relationships where they can give feedback without being judged, et cetera. So what do you tell the youth that, you know, right now everyone's secluded from each other. So what can they do right now to develop these relationships um, better? I think for a start, honestly, probably spend less time on social media. I saw some, uh, some stats recently in the US, I think, that showed that an average user um, was spending four and a half hours a day on social media. But it, it's not, I think, the no matter how sophisticated those platforms are, they're not a substitute for real friendship. What we're seeing in many communities in the US, for example, there's a, um, some wonderful stats that back this up, that the amount of time we're spending uh, with our children is growing, if we're, if, we're in, if we're in family. But the amount of time we're spending as couples alone has almost f fallen off a cliff. Right? And how can you have healthy marriages like that if you don't take care of the adults in the relationship? And also, the amount of time we're spending with friends has also gone off a plateau as well. A cliff as well. The amount of time we're spending in... Uh, in youth clubs, doing the local, you know, the little league, all of these things has also dropped dramatically. So we're we're doing two things: we're spending a lot of time on on Instagram and other places, and then we're also um, spending a a lot of time obsessive as obsessive helicopter parents and mm -hmm. chucking our kids from activity to activity in a very uh, unhelpful way. And that's really, I think, detracted the quality of many of our other relationships of in marriage, but also a friendship as well. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, there's something here called tiger mom. You know, it's like a mm -hmm. phrase used, I'm sure you've heard about it, where kids are being forced to play violin, piano, you know, do excel in school and et cetera. And I think it, at some point it creates a lot of anxiety around those activities that you lose the motivation to do it. Um, I think we have about 10, 10 more minutes before we need to wrap up, but just kind of a few more questions. I mean, you are so highly motivated and driven it seems you're so very successful what do you what do you do when you lose your purpose or sense of autonomy so i think you have to have an honestly an honest conversation about it so i work uh, for the last eight years i've working, been working in the philanthropy world right where we've been funded by large foundations um corporate foundations like mastercard you know ubs the u.s government uh, british government etc and often, I think the way that philanthropy has gone, uh, we've been very lucky to have some very committed donors who haven't done that. But the general trend is towards more and more kind of micromanagement, right? So the, the foundation that's providing the money into our work, um, increasing the trend is for foundations to actually dictate the parts of their grantees, of the organizations they fund, right? Because they want outcomes, they want measurable milestones, all this kind of stuff, which is not unimportant, but very quickly destroy motivation. And I think having an honest discussion with them 
about that and explain what the cost of all this is. And I was talking to NPR, actually, of all things, who are funded by large foundations. And, you know, the, the amount of foundations who want to know how many minutes do people spend on articles. And that stuff is, is actually taking time away from really insightful articles that are game changing, right? And so I think just really making people aware of that. And that's, that's true also if you're a, you know, an athlete and you know, you're, you're on a sports program. It applies lots of ways to manage talent now. How do you make the person managing that process be aware of some of the, of the costs of what they might be doing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's true. You know, we, um, we are not often honest about what we want and we sometimes don't even know how to communicate that or how to think about that. Um, so I think that's very true what you said. Um, we're, I'm just gonna ask you a few questions from the audience now. Um, somebody said here, um, I have, and speaking about honesty, I have interests that differ for, from what my parents want for me. How can I start an honest conversation with them about my passion and about my interests? You know, so one of the things that was really interesting in India, so we work, our team is pretty young, actually, the average is about mid-20s or so, really, really bright graduates and the best, um, you know, graduates from the best universities in India work with us. And this is a constant, um, a constant challenge. And what we started to do is, um, and it sounds crazy, but actually parent days, uh, we would actually bring their parents into the office, talk to them, explain what we were doing, and make it real for them. And I think my, my parents adopted, I think when I did this, this was a real shock that I did something that was outside medicine, but also maybe this wacky as well. But actually helping them meet people in the sector that I was working in, understand it wasn't as crazy as they thought it was. So I think a lot of it, I think the more we try and shout about stuff, the, often the less effective it can be. The more we can expose our, our, our parents to the worlds we want to live in or we already live in, that can actually make it much more familiar and much more comfortable, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, we had a breakout session called the CEO Mindset, in which we discussed the good habits and mentalities that we could build in order to create personal success. So is there one specific tool or are there a handful of tools that are the core of your foundation and your success? I think it's really being clear about purpose, I think is so important. I think of the three, you know, the purpose, the economy, the mastery, purpose comes first, because I think if we know what fight, you know, what ring we want to box in and what fight we want to fight, everything else becomes really, really manageable. And strangely, the more, if we're really clear about that and bought into that, the harder the setback, in a way, the more committed we are to, to, to respond to it, because we know it's the problem. I think I already mentioned Adam Grant, but he has another wonderful expression talking about you know, our life is about finding the problem we want to try and solve. Mm -hmm. And if we know that problem, most of the rest will, 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 will kind of fall by the wayside. We'll figure the rest out as well. But see, that's probably the one, the one thing really. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's, you're saying like knowing your why, right? A lot yeah. of the times when people are setting their goals, the first thing you say is write down all the reasons why you want to do all these things. And referring back to that over and over again, when you lose your drive or motivation or, you know, lose your sense of purpose. And I think Angela Duckworth, who is a, a professor at UPenn, but she, she has a wonderful idea of sort of, you know, we have companies have mission statements. She encourages us all to have a one-line mission statement for ourselves. That can really help us know what is our North Star, what are we trying to go for, and helps us make decisions much better, much better as a result. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think, there's other questions. Um, well, I think we actually talked about a lot of things today and um, even answered a lot of the questions from the audience. Are there a few parting words of wisdom that you would like to say to our audience, to our youth, um, as they navigate the issues that are going to be pretty challenging coming, coming up as we get over this pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, again, a, a really a heartfelt sorry for the, for the mess we, we brought on you guys as well. Um, but. Uh, I do think that this is an incredible opportunity. I know it's been tough. I know some people might have lost jobs, might have lost uh, maybe even loved ones, um, lost a lot of momentum in their lives. But I do think that um, that Tyson example is, is very powerful. And I think that the, the getting knocked in the face can help us rebound. And as long as we take a lot of 10 seconds and, and use this time, these, these three months to 
reconfigure and figure out really what's important to us. I think it's going to be such a big asset for the for the years to come. And you know, I think we live in a world that's uh, you know increasingly uh, you know connected, but increasingly lonely. Uh, Vivek Maharaj has sent a written a book about loneliness, for example, uh, where we individuals can can really thrive and be very very successful, incredibly so. Um, but as a society, we have no sense of progress, right, and purpose, as we've seen uh, this week in so many ways. And I think it just feels like you know, I think my journey has been spectacularly unsuccessful in solving these things. And I think perhaps even had the wrong mindset and the right wrong frame in, in doing that. And I think um, there's a great chance to, um, for, for this generation to, to really question these things. And just like the you know, question of parents, ask the why, right? As you said, Swati, like, try to, why are we doing it this way? And most of the time, there's no better answer than this. it was always done this way. I think really seeing if we can lead together. And what I love so much about um, the conference, the summit, and what you're all doing is just that idea of bringing that collective voice and energy and really challenging um, those of us in power to, to be more thoughtful and to, and to really be more accountable, but also to grab the power yourselves. I think you're in such an exciting stage of life to be able to take the bull by the horns and drive things, as many of you, of course, are already doing. But um, I think there's just no more important time to solve this because we're, I think, really at a, a knife edge on what kind of world we'll, we'll live in, in in the future. And I think a lot of it's about what we do individually, but also how the organizations you work in, what they do, and also societies that we are part of also do as well. Yeah, I think you said it great. This has just been a really good reset. You know, even for me, it has been a really great reset and given me clarity on what I want in my life, you know, I've been so focused on medicine. Um, I think um, moving forward, I really hope that the people listening, you know, use these, this time to move as they move forward to kind of do things a little bit differently to be kinder to nature. You know, we, for example, in India, we finally see less pollution. So moving forward, I really hope that we are, you know, kinder to nature, kinder to the people around us that we really practice, you know, deep listening, like you said, and, and practice honesty. Um, when, if people want to reach out to you, um, what are the best platforms for them to do so? Yeah, please, uh, please find me on LinkedIn. It's uh, Charit Jeevan on, on LinkedIn, and please connect or, or, or uh, follow and love to stay in touch as well. And yeah, the, the book is coming out next, next year. I'll let, I'll let you guys know when it's out. But I think a lot of the ideas I, I shared today, and I think just feels, uh, oh, I just love to keep the conversation going. And a lot of this is about learning together with others. And I think um, it's so important to have the the voice of youth in this discussion about motivation because it's going to be your voice that really matters the most. Yeah, I agree. I feel like you can talk about motivation for more than just an hour, but um, I think we are now at the end of our uh, webinar. So I'm going to actually wrap this up. And I want to say, sure, thank you so much for joining us and for all your pearls of wisdom. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Manav and Janani to wrap this up. Thanks, Pati. Real pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Sharath. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Swati. Thank you, Sharath. Wow. That was extremely profound. I would like to thank once again, Charath, from the bottom of my heart. I feel like we've all absorbed so much beautiful insight on how we can move forward during these unusual times. You've been so eloquent, articulate, and your message is absolutely indispensable. I could listen to you talk forever. And Swati, your moderation of this event was absolutely seamless. So now thank we're going to transition away from the live stream. Uh, I'm going to give a little a uh, couple seconds for that streaming to end. We're going to go just back to our summit participants on Zoom.